Hallelujah. So uh, this week, it's always something, right? This week I received a letter, and uh, it's from a gentleman that uh, had visited our congregation several times in the, in the past. And uh, he's, he's a very intelligent man. He's a real student of the word. Danny, we slide mine down just a little tiny bit. Just a little, there you, not the master, my personal. Thank you, thank you. That's a little too much. Let me boot it back, there you go. And it's the usual stuff that I receive from here and there everywhere. Usual stuff that he sent me, warning me that our Bibles are compromised with errors in grammar and translation from original language, that the canonization process for our Bibles is corrupted and that the Apostle Paul's teaching is at odds with Yeshua and the Torah and on and on it goes. Old stuff, I've heard it a thousand times. From our Ketavei HaShachim portion, for those of you who are new to us, our New Testament portion, it's Rabbi Shaul, or Apostle Paul, that is confronted with a controversial subject in the letter he received, or he actually said, he got from the Corinthian synagogue, which of course we don't have, we have his response, but it was a letter regarding the eating of food or meat offered to idols. And you may wonder how this question has any relevance for us today. But it's actually incredibly relevant as it speaks to the issue of our freedom to choose. See, we face this issue all the time as we consider and debate things such as, is it right for a believer to own and potentially use a firearm? Aren't we, some, in some circles of Christianity, you're supposed to be a pacifist and turn the other cheek, right? Is it right for people the way to watch certain TV shows or movies with cussing or violence? or hetero and homosexuality, or just plain crude joking, often at the expense of believers? Is it right for a believer to drink alcohol on any level, or to smoke pot, or dope, or whatever you want to call it today? It's becoming legal. Should you allow your children or teenagers to play violent video games? Is it okay for a believer to play the lottery or gamble? Of course, none of you here do that. To what extent can or should a believer get involved in politics? There's very strong points of view in that. Should you shop at a store that allows either gender to use whatever bathroom they want? Is Shemitah or bankruptcy acceptable for believers? Is it okay to have tattoos or piercings? Should you use birth control or not? How should we view end-time decisions like, or end-of-life decisions like a DNR, do not resuscitate, and procedures with regard to hospitalization? Is cremation or burial God's will for believers? The list, I could go on and on and on. On and on and on. So based on the letter that I received... I should disregard whatever Rabbi Shaul has to say on these and other issues, but it's hard, it's hard to question the rabbi's wisdom and how to manage, as a believer, this and other gray areas in life. We all have knowledge. <laughs> we all have knowledge according to Rabbi Shaul. However, it's the person who thinks he knows something doesn't yet know in the way they ought to know. That's a powerful statement. And it's a very humbling statement. We all have knowledge. We all read. We all gather information. And the person who thinks he knows or she knows 
something doesn't yet know in the way they ought to know. See, what we find in this Shabbat's Ketavei HaShachim portion are some basic factors that Rabbi Shaul challenges us to consider that serve to guide believers in making personal decisions about questionable areas followers of Yeshua experience to help us to know in the way we ought to know. The essential principle from Shaul governing these factors is that knowledge must be balanced with love. Knowledge must be balanced with love. Now, in order to understand the confusion that the congregation of Corinth faced, we need to understand that there were two sources of food then. The regular market where the prices were a bit higher, and the temple where the meat from the sacrifices was always available. As I shared last Shabbat, very few of the edible items that were offered by the people were completely consumed on the altar. Actually, most of the offered meat, grain, and drink were either to be eaten by the Kohanim only or by both the person making the offering and the Kohanim together. So often, the, the person bringing the offering, he, he just couldn't consume it all on the spot like some of the restaurants we go to these days. So they would take home a rather large doggy bag. Now, some of this food would be eaten at home, while some of it was sold to the local market. Some was purchased by wedding planners or holy day planners and restaurants. Often there was a dining hall that was nearby or in proximity to the temple where the meat was sold to the public and eaten on the premises. This meat originally dedicated to a pagan god could be anywhere. It could be at the market, it could be at a neighbor's home, at a wedding, at a party, a restaurant, at various celebrations, anywhere. The concern was, should believers eat this meat that was offered to idols? Should it be eaten? It's like the proverbial question. If you got your hands on some drug money, if a, if, a, if a drug dealer gave you a bunch of money as a congregation, should you keep it or give it back? I'm not going to give you the answer to that. You're going to have to work that one out on your own. Because those are the questions we have to work out on our own. Should believers eat this meat? Do pagan rituals contaminate the meat and thereby spiritually harm believers? Are believers unwittingly participating in pagan ceremonies if they eat? Are they worshiping false gods if they eat that meat? And a modern example for us would be what? Meat that is halal. A meat that is offered up to the false Muslim god of Allah. It's everywhere, brothers and sisters. It's in Sam's Club. I'm going down the list. Shemot 34, Exodus 34, is clear that we are not to partake of meat that was offered to seal a covenant with a false god. Because that's what you did when you sealed the covenant. But what if one consumes the meat sacrificed to idols outside of the context of the actual temple covenant-making worship of these false gods? What if, as expressed in Numbers 25 or Bami Bar 25, we are not bowing down to Allah <clears throat> and any other false god and just partaking of the barbecue? Sticking to context, which we should as believers, because every decision you're going to make about the interpretation of Scripture is what? Context. All those of you who open your Bibles, all you that read and study your Bibles, bless your hearts. We should. But if you, as, as frequently as I've been mocked or laughed at for going to cemetery or seminary, one valuable lesson they taught over and over and over. Context, context, 
Context. Just like when you shop for a house, what is it, brother? Location, location, location. It's no different. Context, kind. there's two contexts in scriptures. There's a context where it actually appears within the text, and there's context in which what is taking place that you're reading about, that context where the event or the happening is taking place. There's two contexts. Context, context, context. If you stick to the context while eating meat offered to idols is wrong, we discover something in the context. It's wrong only in the context and setting of actively worshiping those false gods. What the Torah does not say, nor can we force it to say as much as we might want to, is that eating meat sacrificed to idols while having no regard for false gods nor worshiping them in any capacity is a violation of Torah. We will not find anywhere in the Torah God saying meat sacrificed to idols in of itself is wrong. For it is to be wrong, it must be combined with a willful worship of whatever false god it is. And of course, the New Testament Ketavish Hashlachim scriptures have to, of course, coincide with the Torah. Because remember, the New Testament or the Ketave Hashachim, they, they confirm Torah. They verify Torah. They're symbiotic with Torah. So whatever we read in the New Testament or the Ketave Hashachim has to line up alongside of what was already declared in the scriptures that Yeshua preached from. So, and so what, in doing so, when we go to those scriptures, it leads us to the requirements to the Gentiles in Acts 15, 19 to 20. Therefore, my opinion is, says, uh, says uh, yeah, my opinion is that we should not put obstacles in the way of the goyim who are turning to God. Instead, we should write them a letter telling them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from fornication, from what is strangled, and from blood. Okay? And just as in the Torah, we read that eating meat sacrificed to idols was wrong in the context, in the context of active false god worship, we find that Acts 15, it isn't any different. It isn't any different. The converted Gentiles, what were they doing before they converted? Worshipping idols. <laughs> right. They came out of a system of, that engaged in pagan sun god worship. Active worship included going to the pagan temple, sacrificing and eating of that sacrifice, drinking its blood, and engaging in temple prostitution. That is why Yaakov or James mentions all of these things. Yaakov is telling converted Gentiles as new believers that a true believer must first stop worshiping false gods before learning the Torah, which is the very next instruction after that portion from Acts 15, 19 to 20, which is verse 21. For from the earliest times, Moshe has had in every city those who proclaim him with his words being read in the synagogue every Shabbat. Thus, James is not necessarily saying not to eat meat sacrificed to idols. He is in fact saying not to eat meat sacrificed to idols in the context of active sun god worship. Nowhere in the Torah do we find a literal, clear command to not eat meat sacrificed to idols. We are only given the command to not worship false gods. Rabbi Shaul is teaching in our Ketavayah scheme portion that if one goes to the meat market, say, like I said, Sam's Club, and buys and eats meat sacrificed to idols, like halal meat, that should be of no concern. Why? False gods are nothing, right? It's a false god. It's fake. It's a fake god. False gods only become something when we are worshiping them, esteeming them, glorifying them, and therefore making them to be idols in our lives. 
you make them something when you, when you acknowledge them. Isn't that the way it is in, in life? When somebody thinks so much of themselves, well, the only way you're going to affirm that is if you affirm them, if you acknowledge them. Isn't that what God does to us when we think we're pretty high on ourselves? He gets really quiet. <laughs> very, very quiet. He doesn't affirm us in any way whatsoever. However, if we know that false gods are nothing, which they are, then by that very def definition, we're, we're not worshiping false idols when we eat their sacrifices. Something that is nothing can't be something. Something that is nothing can't be something. It seems to be just like common sense, but that is basically Rabbi Shaul's point and appears to fit in the context of the two examples from Bami Bar and Shemot in the Torah. Now, the people of the way who were stronger in their faith understood that idols could not contaminate food. Idols can't contaminate food, so they saved money by purchasing the cheaper meat made available from the temples, the pagan temples. And additionally, if non-observant friends invited them to a gathering, right? We've all been through that, haven't we? Haven't we? Easter? <laughs> Easter dinner, Christmas dinner, family functions? Sure we have. If you're around non-observant friends and you're invited to a gathering where sacrificed meat was being served, the strong believers would attend it. However, Shaul does mention something important to consider. He mentions that some that are weaker in the faith may not understand, may not understand the Torah that well yet. They're new believers, and so they're easily offended, easy, quickly bothered. Many of them had come to know Yeshua and made the choice to leave their life of pagan idolatry so they couldn't understand why their fellow believers would want to have anything to do with meat that had been sacrificed to idols. And this created the potential for division, division in the kehilat. So the leaders asked Shaul for counsel. How do we manage this? And as he instructed them, Rabbi Shaul called their attention to three important factors when they're making this decision, when they're trying to process or manage the situation. The three factors were knowledge, love, and conscience. Knowledge, love, and Conscience. Conscience. And of course, beginning with knowledge, we read again from our Ketavei Hashachim portion, now about food sacrifice to idols. We know, we know that as you say, we all have knowledge. <laughs> yes, that is so, but knowledge puffs a person up with pride, whereas love builds up. The person who thinks he knows something doesn't yet know in the way they ought to know. So at the beginning of this same letter, this first letter to Corinth, Shaul is expressing how prideful this congregation were of their spiritual knowledge. You can read it for yourself in the chapter 1, verse 5. They knew that an, that an idol was nothing more than a depiction of a false god who existed only in the minds of those who chose to worship it. So for them, the conclusion was logical. It was logical. A non-existent God could not contaminate food on an altar. So why then were the weak followers in Corinth upset with their fellow believers when their position regarding this obvious reality that meat couldn't possibly be contaminated by gods that didn't actually exist was so logical. Because as Commander Spock learned at the end of his career, what did Spock learn? Not every problem can be solved with logic. A child who's afraid of the dark 
is not going to be assured by you with a logical reason why you shouldn't be afraid in the dark. It's not going to minister to them. We need to understand something. We need to understand that knowledge in of itself can be a weapon. It can be a weapon to fight with or a tool to build with. Depending, of course, how you choose to use it. So we need to remind ourselves that knowledge, again, must be balanced with love. If knowledge is used to puff up our pride, then it cannot be simultaneously used to build up someone else's faith. As people, the way we are commanded often in Scripture to, to build one another up. My wife's good at it. Building people up, encouraging you, lifting you up, giving you, giving you opportunities to achieve and excel. The author of Hebrews says this, let us keep paying attention to one another in order to spur each other on to love and good deeds, not neglecting our own congregational meeting. Glad none of you do that. As some have made a practice of doing, but rather encouraging each other and let us do this all the more as you see the day approaching. Chapter, again, 8-2 from our Ketavei HaShokim portion reveals this oxymoron. And what is the oxymoron? That a know-it-all attitude is frequently evidence of ignorance. <laughs> a know-it-all attitude is frequently evidence of ignorance. The person who actually knows truth is typically aware of how much they don't know. I've said that many, many times. Those of us who have risen in the martial arts ranks, as I have, you come to realize, oh my goodness, <laughs> I'm not really that tough. There's a whole lot tougher people out there. Just watch me in a room with Coach Ron when he's here. You'll get, you'll get pretty quick evidence of that. <laughs> but that's true. It's true. As you learn more, you realize how little you really know. That's why we need faith. We need to remember that knowing doctrine doesn't necessarily lead us to knowing or living for God. It's very possible, brothers and sisters, to grow in biblical knowledge and not yet grow in grace or righteousness. The primary test is what? It's love which is the second factor that Rabbi Shaul discusses in our portion today. Verse, reading verses from chapter 8, 3 to 6 now. However, if someone loves God, God knows him. So as for eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that, as you say, an idol has no real existence in the world. There's only one God. For even if there are so-called gods, either in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are gods and lords galore, yet for us there's one God, one God, the Father from whom all things come and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, through whom were created all things and through whom we have our being. Brothers and sisters, love and knowledge must go together. They're symbiotic. Love and knowledge must go together like prayer and fasting. When you see in Scripture, prayer, you don't see this prayer. You see prayer and fasting. Peas and carrots. <laughs> They're meant to go together. Rabbi Shul expresses this in his letter to Ephesus, chapter 4, verse 15, when he explains that we need to speak the truth how? How do we speak the truth? In love. We speak it in love. And it's been said that truth without love is brutality. Truth without love is brutality, but love without truth is hypocrisy. Knowledge is power, but it must be used in love. Strong believers in the Corinthian congregation had knowledge, but they were not using their knowledge in love. Instead of building up the weaker saints, the strong believers were only puffing themselves up. 
Shaul's desire was for the stronger saints to help the weaker saints to grow, to mature. Now, some people have the false notion that it's strong, what makes a strong believer a strong believer is are, are, are the ones who live by the letter of the law, live by the letter of the law, and, and get offended when others exercise their freedom in Yeshua by the spirit of the law. But that's actually not the case. I can't tell you how many times I've been corrected about halakha. I can't tell you how many times well, that's not how we do it. That's not how that is done. See, it's the weaker believers. It's the weaker believers who are bound by the letter of the law and are afraid, afraid to embrace, as Yeshua and his followers did, the spirit of the law as exampled by him. It is the weaker believers who are prone to judge and to criticize stronger believers and stumble over what they do. You know, the judgment and criticism, of course, makes it more difficult for the stronger saints to minister to the weaker brothers and sisters. And it is here, brothers and sisters, that love enters the picture because love builds up. It puts others first ahead of yourself. So when spiritual knowledge is used in love, the stronger believer can take the hand of the weaker believer and help them to stand and walk so as to enjoy their freedom in Messiah Yeshua. You can't, brothers and sisters, as much as you want to try, you can't force feed, you can't force feed immature believers and transform them into giants of faith. You can't force that. Knowledge must be balanced by love. Otherwise, we'll end up with big heads instead of enlarged hearts. There's so much of that in the so-called Messianic movement. Big heads but small hearts. So what does this look like in practice? I'll give you an example. Let's use, uh, let's use alcohol, for example. So let's say you are a believer that likes uh, a margarita on Cinco de Mayo. You like a margarita on Cinco de Mayo, but you're in the company of a fellow believer who has maybe struggled with alcohol, had a bad experience in their family in the past, seen the negative effects of alcohol, been abused by alcohol, or is of the theological opinion that believers should abstain from drinking, then out of love, you could choose to order a sweet tea instead. Couldn't you? But again, there are some who will be wondering, obviously with that response, why is it that I have to change? Why not them? Why is it always on me? Why shouldn't they get over it? And realize that this is okay and just deal with it. That's a good spirit, isn't it? Well, there's a couple reasons for this. First, it's always the stronger person who is to help the weaker person in life, whether it's stronger mentally, emotionally, physically. If you want a relationship with someone who is weaker, you have to help them. You have to help them. This is what we do for our kids. We, are, we don't look down on them for not knowing as much as we do or not being as physically capable or strong. We help them because we love them. Here's, honey, let me help you with that, don't we say? Let me help you with that. So come to me for, well, what's going on? I want to help you with that problem. That's why we do that with our children because we love them. Secondly, we do this because our model is Yeshua. And Yeshua willingly did what? <laughs> he laid down everything. He laid down everything so that we could have access to him. So as we follow him, we also are to willingly lay down our rights and love others so that we can build them up, which is what we should want to do. Knowledge and love 
are very important factors that have to work in tandem. They have to work together. Knowledge, again, must be balanced by love if we are to use our spirit-led observance in the right way. But there is a third factor that is revealed in the remaining verses of chapter 8, verses 7 to 13, and I'll read this to you. But not everyone, says Rabbi Shul, not everyone has this knowledge. Moreover, some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat food which has been sacrificed to them, they think of it as really affected by the idol and their consciousness, their consciousness being weak and thus defiled. Now, food will not improve our relationship with God. We will be neither poorer if we abstain or richer if we eat. However, watch out that your mastery of the situation does not become a stumbling block to the weak. You have this knowledge, but suppose someone with a weak conscience sees you sitting and eating a meal in the temple of an idol, won't they be built up wrongly to eat this food which has been sacrificed to idols? Thus, by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, this brother for whom the Messiah died. And so when you sin against the brothers by wounding their conscience when it is weak, you are sinning against the Messiah? To sum up, if food will be a snare for my brother, I will never eat meat again, lest I cause my brother to sin. It's the greater good. Or you have your freedom to have whatever you want, your margarita or your f- hamburger that is halal. If it causes your brother to be bothered by it or sin, feel sin from that. Is that so important that you have your way? That's what Rabbi Shaul is challenging us with from his point of view. If it's a snare for my brother or sister, I'll never eat meat again, lest I cause my brother to sin. Conscience is the internal bait din. Those of you who don't know what that is, house of judgment or the court of judgment. It's the, it's the inner courtroom of decision in our lives. We try to anesthetize that with more than one margarita to be able to do whatever we want whenever we want. But in the end, it's still there, still speaking to us. It speaks to us about our actions and judges them and lets us know whether they are okay or not okay. Okay? Not okay. Conscience is not the Torah, but it bears witness to it. It bears witness to the Torah. And the important thing for us to consider is this. Conscience depends upon knowledge. The more spiritual knowledge we know and act on, the stronger our conscience will become. Some believers have very weak consciences because they have been saved for a very short period of time and have not had as much opportunity to mature and grow in the faith. Like little children in the home, they need to be kind of guarded carefully. Where I used to watch my son every moment, what's he up to now? What, what, what are they doing? Right? Now they're in a car driving around the city. Things have changed. I don't call him up every minute and go, where are you at? What are you doing? Right? I don't do that anymore. Right? Other saints have uh, weak consciousness because they don't want to grow. Yeah, that's true. Some just don't want to grow. Like some people want to be homeless. Some people don't want to be productive citizens of society. They want to mooch off the system. They don't care any which way they can do it. There are lots of jobs out there. I don't want to work. Governments give me 600 plus bucks, bucks a month plus unemployment. I'll, I'm, I'm staying at home. There are people that think that way. Right? They ignore the word and fellowship with fellow believers and remain in a state of infancy. It's so hard to watch that. It's one of the real challenges, as, as, as so many are in full time ministry. 
to watch people who seem to have knowledge but don't respond to the knowledge and remain just babies in the faith. Babies. They don't grow. They don't, they don't evolve. As for me, says Rabbi Shaul, brothers, I couldn't talk to you as spiritual people, but as worldly people, as babies, so far as experience with the Messiah is concerned, I gave you milk, not solid food, because you were not re- ready for it. But you aren't ready for it now either, for you are still worldly. Isn't it obvious from all the jealousy and quarreling among you that you are worldly and living by merely human standards? Isn't it obvious? Do you guys get it? But some believers remain weak because they are afraid to freely trust God's Ruach HaKodesh, His Holy Spirit, to lead them. They're like a child that's old enough to go to school, but is afraid to leave home and must be taken to school each day. A child who's afraid to do this, a child who wants to just stay where they are, emotionally, spiritually, physically. They just don't want to grow up and change and evolve. Shaul tells us in his first letter that the conscience of a weak believer is three things. It's easily defiled, easily wounded, and easily offended. Easily defiled, easily wounded, and easily offended. So for this reason, the stronger saints must defer to the weaker saints and do nothing that would harm them, harm their relationship with the Lord. It might not harm the faith of a mature saint to share a feast in an adulterous temple, but it might offend his weaker brother. Rabbi Shaul, again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, warns that the immature believer might decide to imitate his stronger brother and thus be led into sin. We are commanded to be careful to be careful not to be a stumbling block to others. This doesn't mean that we have to pamper (laughs) everybody that we come in contact. We don't have to pamper those who are weaker in the faith. It means that our goal should always be to build them up and help them grow rather than demanding our rights and freedoms and liberties. Therefore, states Rabbi Shul, it might be better it might be better, consider, to not eat meat at all rather than offend a brother or sister when she's talking about specifically meat offered to idols. And to that I agree. It's always best to maintain shalom, is it not? It's always best to maintain peace than to intentionally cause strife in the body of Messiah. You know, as I wrap this up, part of uh, Yeshua's ministry, and he came to do so many amazing things in this time that was here. He was here. Amazing things. And there were different parts of his ministry, different mission within his ministry. Part of his ministry is to show us what we ought to know about what we do know. Did you catch that? to show us what we ought to know about what we do know. What you need to know about what you think you know. What we ought to know is knowledge, again, must be balanced with love. Look, at you. we're free in Yeshua. We have free will, we have free choice, but we must take care that our spiritual knowledge, our freedom, is not licensed and that is balanced by love, and that we do not tempt the weaker believer to run ahead of their conscience. Brothers and sisters, when knowledge, when it happens, when it is balanced by love, the strong follower will have a ministry to the weak follower, and the weak follower will thus grow and become strong. This is our aim, isn't it not, as people of the way? Look at the room we're in here. 
There are people that have been in the faith for 40, 50 years of their life. They have walked with the Lord every, like, they can't remember when they weren't walking with the Lord. And then there's other people that just got born again and saved moments ago. And some of the things, the way we live our lives and conduct ourselves, they're like looking at some examples out there. They're going, I'm not really sure this is what God wants for us. Because they don't have the knowledge. They have knowledge, but they don't know about what they know. Just like meat offered to idols. As the body Messiah, it's our goal at least it should be, at all times to strengthen and respect every part of the body of God that, that God has given us, every part of the body of Messiah, that he might be glorified in that the body might be built up to unity and strength. As you interact, brothers and sisters, from this day on with others, please consider balancing your knowledge with love so that others might be built up rather than tore down. The way you relate carries weight. The way you relate carries weight. What was Yeshua's way to relate? His way was to relate in love. So should we. Please rise. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we, as believers, each and every moment are working out our salvation. We're working out what we know. We, we know things, and some of the things we've known one way and some things we've known another way. For many of us, we knew something for years a certain way, and we realized that we had to know a little bit more about what we knew. And a lot of what we had to come to know about is about our own attitudes and spirits, how we approached this world and others with what we know, how we used it. To, was it a weapon to tear down, or was a, something to build people up? Was a rock that we threw at people, or was a rock was a cornerstone that we built something with? God forgive us, if, Father, we've taken the knowledge that we have and we have compromised the spiritual walk of those who are perhaps fresh, new, or maybe just weaker in the faith. Father, each one of us at one moment or another have had crises of faith. And Lord, certain conduct and actions by others have, have sometimes, at times have made us second guess what we believe or how we should believe it. The important thing for us, Father, is to put self aside and help us to realize that no matter what freedoms that are afforded us in Messiah Yeshua, the Father, it's important for us to look beyond our freedoms that, you know, that we have been blessed with in our knowledge that has come from your word, and to be mindful of those around us, and sometimes to set those freedoms aside for the sake of the weaker brother and sister, to help build them up in the faith and bring them to a place of strength and understanding as well. And all these things, Father, again, it comes back to that central message from Paul. Yeshua, help us to know what we ought to know and what we know. And we pray these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Give a Yahweh Vaish Marecha Sadonai Panavalecha Vichanecha Sadonai Panavalecha Simlecha Shalom. The Lord bless you. And keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift his countenance upon you and may he grant you this Shabbat and the days to follow his peace because that is what we desire. B'Shem Yeshua, he is peace.
He is love. He is truth. He is our way. It's in his name we pray. Amen and amen.